Well, thanks very much. It's a pleasure to be here. Uh, I have a daughter who's in school at Swarthmore. Unfortunately, I won't get to see her uh, this quick trip, but I get over here a fair amount, and it's, it's a great pleasure to be here. I've been asked to make uh, an announcement. Um, the first is I observe that uh, you're just exactly like our students. You all sit in the back. <laughs> and, and so uh, I will um, uh, start the quiz from the back, right? Okay. Uh, and we will have uh, grading points for class participation. And your class participation grade will be zero if your cell phone goes off. Uh, I have been asked to uh, remind people that we are videotaping today. And anybody who's on the lam from the cops ought to leave now. Uh, but that the cell phones disrupt greatly the, uh, the videotape. So I'm going to talk to you today about uh, carbon and climate issues. Um, and, and what I'm going to try to do is to talk briefly and in a non-technical way about five things. What's the basic science behind uh, climate change? Isn't there enormous uncertainty about climate change? And what impacts can we expect to see? What can we do to reduce climate change and minimize these impacts? And is any of this affordable? So those are the topics I want to cover. So let me start with the first one. What's the basic science? And I will leave uh, some time at the end for uh, questions. And there will be a quiz. Right. Okay, so. so a quick review. We get uh, the bulk of the energy on this planet from the sun. Not all of it. There is some radioactive decay uh, in the Earth, which is why we're not a cold cinder at the moment. But of 100 units of sunlight that hit the Earth, 30 are reflected back out, 70 warm uh, the surface. It may not seem that way in Philadelphia in February, but they do. Okay. Um, while the atmosphere is transparent to visual light, which is why our eyes evolved to see in those particular frequencies, um, it is opaque to infrared heat. Okay. And heat energy gets trapped. That some of this 70% gets trapped by the atmosphere, some by clouds, and that's greenhouse effect. That's all there is to it. Um, CO2, which is about 365 parts per million of the atmosphere now, right, is a trace constituent. Together with water vapor, it keeps Earth quite a bit warmer, about 65 degrees Fahrenheit warmer. Uh, and I will apologize to the president of the ACS, I'm going to use Fahrenheit. Uh, rather than uh, Celsius in, in this general presentation. Um, I used to be a planetary atmospheres astronomer. And the first planet that I studied was Venus. Um, Venus has an atmosphere that's more or less 100 atmospheres of CO2. The temperature of the surface there is hot enough to melt lead. And it's not because it's closer to the sun. I mean, that would account for 10 or 15 degrees. That's all. That is entirely due to CO2. There is no water vapor to speak of in the Venus's atmosphere. Uh, the greenhouse effect is not just a theory, as some people, uh, like Senator from Oklahoma, would have you believe. It's, it, it's real. There's no question about it. Um, OK, so let me show you what's been happening. This is raw data uh, on the big greenhouse gases. Here's CO2. This is the last 10,000 years. And there are some natural changes, although this portion of the CO2 in the last 5,000 years is, is people. But look at what's happened since the Industrial Revolution. Okay? Same with methane, same with nitrous oxides. Although there, uh, the data back here is a little fuzzier. It's still clear. All of the main CO2 gases uh, have had much higher uh, concentrations in the atmosphere since the beginning of the Industrial Revolution. Note that the scale here is not zero. Okay, uh, It's about 30% increase in the concentration of these heat-trapping gases in the atmosphere. Right. That's all rather abstract. Fine. This is an after-dinner talk. I don't want anybody except for the kids who already fell asleep to be snoring. Um, so let me try and make this kind of specific. How many of you went to school in Pittsburgh? Right, OK, good. How many of you have heard of Pittsburgh? <laughs> OK, good. There's a big power plant just near the Pittsburgh airport. It's called the Bruce Mansfield Power Plant. It's one of the biggest power plants in the country. Uh, it's about 2,700 megawatts. Uh, 
repowered. It's now down to 2360. And it uses a bunch of coal. Okay? It uses about 230 100-ton cars of coal a day. Right? It's a lot of coal. If you ask, what is the amount of those 230 cars of coal that is CO2 which is released to the atmosphere every day, it's about 130 such cars. Okay? Um, and, and you know, there's a bunch of plants like this all over the US and, and all over the world. There is a fair amount of emissions. In fact, my industry, the electric power industry, and where's the guy from NRG? Ah, there we are. Our industry is responsible for about 38% of all the CO2 released in this country. Another 30% uh, is from vehicles, and, and those are fungible. If you get uh, plug-in electric vehicles, you could convert them to electric power if it turns out to be cheaper to reduce carbon in that way than distribute it. Um, so let's back to the science. This is the last 150 years of globally average temperatures. The blue is kind of the error bands in this, and, and the uh, black is the trend. There's been about a degree, a degree and a quarter of warming over the last uh, 100 years. Um, and so you might ask the question, are these just spurious correlations? Aren't they due to other things? Hasn't the sun changed? Isn't there more soot around? Uh, how can it possibly be just the greenhouse gases? So what I'm going to show you, uh, since there's some temperate school graduates here, and the others are Roman Hawes, and I'm not worried about uh, you not being able to read a graph. I'm going to show you a graph of all of these effects. First, the sun hitting the Earth's surface deposits a little more than 300 watts for every square meter. Okay, so keep that number in mind, about 350 watts, more or less. So here's a graph of everything, these forcings since 1880. So this one, the red one, is the greenhouse gas and notice the scale. It's about 3 watts per square meter, more or less 1% change. But there's other things. Doesn't the sun change? Yeah, it does. Here's the 11-year solar cycle in orange. It's not doing anything. People who say, yeah, it just gets hotter and colder than the sun, no. Uh, the other interesting one are volcanic emissions. This is Krakatoa. Okay? This is Mount Pinatubo. And they are significant. They take about an uh, order of seven years to wash out all that junk from the atmosphere. But they do cool the planet significantly. So what's the net? The current net forcing is about two watts per square meter. There's a fair uncertainty in it. And some of the uncertainty is due to change, like these changes and so forth. Uh, the other negative one, by the way, are aerosols. Uh, we're putting from uh, industrial activity, and power plants are certainly some of them, aerosols which do reflect uh, in the atmosphere. But you'll hear an awful lot of qualitative statements about these effects. This is the quantitative uh, answer. And, you know, and everybody from either Roman Hawks or Tepper uh, are quant folks. Right? And so this is not only large, but it is going up. Okay. So if you model these things, you can answer the question, are humans really the cause? The r pink areas are models with human releases of greenhouse gases. The blue ones are the same models, and you turn that off. And the black is what really happened. Okay? And while there are some discrepancies, like this hump here, uh, back in 1940 or so, basically, the data follows the models. Whether you're talking about global, or the land, or the ocean areas, there's pretty decent evidence, even this early, where you're not seeing very much in the, the global warming, it's just coming out of the noise, that the models match better with greenhouse gas emissions than without. OK. So this is where they're coming from. This is uh, latest data from 2004. China and the US are probably the same on emissions at the moment, more or less. But these are the top 25. The top 25 emit virtually all of the stuff. 84% okay. of all of the, uh, the fossil fuel carbon emissions are from the top 25 uh, nations. 25th is Kazakhstan. Okay. Right. Any Borat fans here? Right. So, okay. Now, this is the most important piece of science about CO2. 
and it is something that the state regulators, and until fairly recently, the congressional staffers did not understand. If you have a conventional pollutant, SO2, NOx, whatever it is, soot, it washes out of the atmosphere in days to weeks, some months, but mostly really quick. And so that if you stabilize the emissions of, let's say, sulfur dioxide, SO2, you will stable the, stabilize the concentration in the atmosphere quite quickly. This is an inventory problem, right? I'm making widgets. They're piling up in my warehouse. If I sell them as fast as I make them, then the concentration in the warehouse stays the same. CO2 is not like that. CO2 stays in the atmosphere a long, long time. Order of a century, 75 years is the one over E point for those of you who are presidents of the American Chemical Society. Okay. It stays in there for a long time. What that means is that if you stabilize emissions, the concentration goes up. In our example, you're not selling things very fast, and so the concentration of product in the warehouse goes up if you maintain the same factory output. In order to stabilize the concentration in the atmosphere, we're going to have to reduce greatly the emissions. To stabilize the concentration of CO2 in the atmosphere, to take that one greenhouse gas, at twice the pre-industrial levels, we're going to have to decrease the amount of CO2 we emit by 80%. Uh, by 2050, it would, it would um, uh, then result in double pre-industrial levels of CO2. It's kind of like filling up a bathtub, another analogy. Um, if you're putting CO2 into the atmosphere at about 7 billion tons a year, and you're taking it out at about 4 billion tons a year, which are the right numbers, the bathtub's going to fill up. Let's suppose you cut this down to four. The bathtub stays where it is. You've got to cut it down substantially in order to reduce the amount of water in the bathtub. Okay. And that is the key piece, qualitative piece, of CO2 and other greenhouse gases that is totally different from how your intuition works from conventional pollutants. Okay. Most important thing to remember. What that means is that you'll hear a lot of talk about China's yearly emissions about the same as the US, so we're not going to do anything until China does. The fact is that, that is, that's true, and these are the emissions from the USA. We're number one. USA is number one. Uh, here's China about coming up. India is not really a player. Uh, the EU has stabilized emissions, but look at the concentrations. If you count the number of molecules in this room that are blue for the US and red for China, you know. Most of them at the US, the EU is a close second because we were the two nations that were emitting since the start of the Industrial Revolution. China is not going to pass the US even if they continue their exponential growth until fairly late in this century in the concentration. And that's what the planet responds to. Not emissions. The planet doesn't give a damn about how much CO2 is being emitted, right? It's the amount of CO2 in the atmosphere that the planet cares about. Uh, the reason I bring this up is that you'll hear a lot of equity arguments uh, based on things like this in the coming years as we try and decide on whether there should be carbon policy both in the US and post Kyoto in the rest of the world. Now let me deal with isn't there enormous uncertainty? I've talked a little bit about that. The answer is there's no uncertainty about whether greenhouse gases including CO2 and some others are, are warming the planet. There is uncertainty about how much more greenhouse gases humans are going to add over, let's say, the next 50 years, how much additional warming those gases are going to cause. What's called the climate sensitivity is if you double CO2, what's the average planetary temperature increase? That's highly uncertain. By highly uncertain, I mean if you double it, the estimates are between 2 degrees centigrade, 4 degrees Fahrenheit, and as much as 8 degrees centigrade, 15 degrees Fahrenheit. Okay. And the details on whether you know, natural ecosystems, human activities, those are highly uncertain. I was out in Arizona last week talking uh, to the Salt River Project, and they have some consultant that tells them what's going to happen to the temperature in Arizona. And I waved the BS flag. Right? Those studies that the downscaling studies, as they're called, are just not mature. There is great uncertainty about that. And, and let me make that qualitative, quantitative. 
These are graphs uh, showing in each box a different economic um, case. This lower one is sort of business as usual, and the top one is fairly significant greenhouse gas control. The left set of peaks is for the decade of temperature in 2020 to 2029, and the right set is the end of the century. And these are about a half a dozen different models. And you'll notice that within each economic scenario that there's a fair tail, right? Let's go down to this one, and you can see these are as much as 8 degrees centigrade uh, change. Sorry, I'm old-fashioned. I don't say Celsius. Uh, there is uncertainty in this. And these are the temperature maps. Uh, by 2030, we expect to see over much of the northern hemisphere a uh, couple of degrees, maybe. The largest warming is going to be at the poles, and you can see that clearly by the end of the century. But there's no question that there's uncertainty both within the economic scenarios and what economic path people are going to follow. I'll talk to you about the details. It is clearly uncertain whether either the number or the intensity of hurricanes is affected by uh, global temperatures. Okay? Uh, and it's unclear how much the Atlantic uh, circulation, the Gulf Stream and its countercurrent are affected. You know, the only reason why England is habitable uh, is the Gulf Stream, right? It's at the latitude of Labrador. If that puppy shuts down, I mean, warm beer is not going to be their only problem, right? Uh, and there was a thought that this conveyor belt would shut down. It's not at all clear that that's going to happen. Um, there's large uncertainty about those things. So what impacts can we expect to see with fair degree of certainty. Well, as I said, warming is going to be highest at the poles. The US Navy believes that there will be an ice-free Arctic Ocean maybe by 2050, actually. Uh, their studies show that. And indeed, the Northwest Passage that you all read about in the Great Adventures of Youth was open in September, okay, for the first time ever. And this is a graph showing uh, the percentage change in sea ice uh, over the last decade, and it's been changing about, uh, decreasing by about 10% per decade. Okay? Uh, and this year was a, a big anomalous year. And the whole Northwest Passage was open. You could have gone from Greenland uh, out to Japan in, uh, in a boat for about two weeks in September. So there are also going to be, and have been already, changes in the ocean. The acidity of the <coughs> oceans is increasing because when you put CO2 in the atmosphere, the ocean atmosphere interface takes up some of the CO2. It turns into carbonic acid. And there's been a pH change of about a tenth of a pH unit all over the world at the surface. And it's less down at depths. But you can see it 3,000 feet down. Okay? That has serious impacts. Uh, it may affect the toxicity of other pollutants in the oceans. Uh, it's clear that anything we do is going to not reverse things in time to cause a pH change of three tenths uh, at the deep ocean and five tenths at the surface by 2100. There's going to be a very different ocean, whatever we do, even if we implement right now this 80 percent uh, uh, reduction. Coral reefs are a big part of uh, not only the folks like me who like to dive on them, but the livelihood of a bunch of people. Of course, the oceans are going to expand, warm water expands. There's great uncertainty in how much uh, this is. This is out of the last Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change report. And you can see all these various scenarios and the error bars. This is about a half a meter of sea level rise. I used to live two meters above sea level when I was down in Houston. So a half meter is a lot. That may actually considerably underestimate the sea level rise. The IPCC limited itself to only published reports. And some of the new data on what's happening in Greenland uh, was not yet published. This is a picture showing what's melded now, the red and pink, and what melded just 13 years ago. This is 2005 data and 2002 data in Greenland. There has been considerable melt. And, and every year since, you've seen that. This is just a nicely processed map. What happens when you get surface melts like this uh, on the Greenland ice cap, has, you know, people thought, well, yeah, it just lays there and you, know, you can splash it on your face and so forth. Actually, what happens is it sinks through crevices. 
and it lubricates the bottom of the glaciers. And what they've found is extraordinary rates of the glaciers moving towards the oceans uh, that, that they didn't expect. And that was not incorporated in the last slide that I showed you. Maybe an underestimate. Okay. So what can we re do to reduce climate change? The simple answer is just to reduce greenhouse gases and adapt to the inevitable changes. Whatever we do now, there's going to be changes. The atmosphere is going to be at least you know, three degrees warmer uh, centigrade than it is now. Okay? So there will have to be some adaptation. I'm not going to talk much about that today. Talk about the CO2 emissions. As I said, 38% from electric power industries in the US, 38% or so from transportation, um, some other things including chemicals and petroleum and uh, so forth and so on. There are a bunch of things that can be done today conservation and efficiency, switching to lower carbon fuels, distributed generation because it can increase efficiency, nuclear, wind, and biomass. I'm going to talk about most of those, although I, I won't talk about too much about biomass. So conservation. Let me consider the case of refrigerators. This is a graph that ends in 2003, starting at the end of World War II. This one up here is the size of refrigerators. They've been getting bigger. Okay, Sorry, this one is the size of refrigerators. This is the uh, annual energy use, and it's been getting smaller as the size of the refrigerators have been getting bigger. Why? Because they've been DOE standards. And the price has been going down, too. This is in real dollar cost, the price of a refrigerator. Okay? So it's clear that some things can do that. Now, there's some other things that don't work so well. How many of you bought a high-efficiency air conditioner, one of these high-sear rating air conditioners? All right. The problem with those things is that they're great when they come to you and five years later their efficiency degrades. Measure your electric power consumption for those now and in five years and you'll see it degrade. So you've got to be real careful with all these programs, right? It's not for the faint of heart. It's not happens. Um, when plasma TVs or big screen TVs come down to $500 for your you know, 90 inch TV, Katie bar the door on electric power use. NRG is going to make a lot of money. <laughs> okay. uh, electric power use is going to go up. On the other hand, solid state lighting, which is going to supplant compact fluorescence in about five years, is much more efficient. About 20% of all electric power use is for lighting. In 20 years, I'd say that's down to you know, a few percent. Okay. So th there are definite uh, wins to be made in conservation. Both well, California and Vermont have, have done good programs. California is dumping $750 million a year into their conservation program. Oh, we're doing fine on time. Um, fuel switching. Natural gas has, uh, order of magnitude, half the CO2 emissions of coal. Okay, what are the problems? Well, this is the price of natural gas. How many of you use natural gas in your business? Yeah. So you know this graph. Yeah, <laughs> right. Uh, how many of you want to slit your wrist when it gets up to you know, 12 or 14 bucks? Um, North American natural gas is declining. How many people think that the Alaska pipeline that they're talking about is going to save us? Ah, oh, you're smart. The public <laughs> thinks it's all good. The Alaska natural gas pipeline, even if it um, comes in, will be about 1 trillion cubic feet a year Currently, we're using 22 or 23 uh, trillion cubic feet a year. You know, it's going to be a few percent, five percent or so. It's not going to be until there's huge fleets of natural, of uh, liquefied natural gas tankers plying the seas, tying us, by the way, to our old friends in the Middle East and our new friends in Russia, um, that uh, we're going to have any way to counteract the decrease in uh, imported supplies. Currently, we're using about 10% of our natural gas for electric power, and that's driven out a lot of other uses. And if we you know, double that, that's going to go up a lot more. So how about combined heat and power? These are a good deal because they can increase efficiency tremendously because you use the waste heat. And many of you probably in your businesses have combined heat and power uh, at some point you know, for process heat. Uh, when natural gas price was cheap, these things, Capstone uh, makes turbines, uh, we're getting big. At, you know, $14 natural gas or even at $8 natural gas it doesn't make so much sense as it did at two or three. Um, they are still a good idea, and I think we are going to see more of them. Okay. Nuclear. 
the French have, you know, nearly all their electricity, 88% of Electricité de France's uh, power generation is nuclear power. It was a conscious decision after the 73 oil embargo on the part of the government to go nuclear. And they do it very, very well. Okay. Do I think there's going to be a nuclear resurgence in this country? I think to some extent, yes. Uh, and NRG has, uh, has applied for the first combined operating license. But there are some real issues. There's disposal of spent fuel. We have some good ways to do it on site. While Harry Reid still has breath, there will never be Yucca Mountain, right? Uh, but there are some good ways. The cost is the real killer, okay, for the new nuclear facilities. Uh, and if that can get reasonable, yes, I think there's going to be. Liability and safety are reasonable. Internationally, uh, the reprocessing into the fuel cycle, I think, needs to have some international standards to avoid the kind of messes that we're seeing all around the world that you can read about uh, daily. This, by the way, is a picture I took uh, in a light airplane near Three Mile Island about a year ago. And one of these uh, units, this one here, should be producing, but it's not for obvious reasons. Wind. Wind's going to save the planet, right? It's not wind, it's solar. Um, about half a percent of U.S. electric power comes from wind. It can plausibly get to 20 percent before there's some technical issues. But look at this ridge in Pennsylvania. That's a picture, again, I took from my aircraft. Uh, and, you know, this is using Roundup or some other great chemical to clear the area there. The people are fighting this like crazy. And any of you who follow the Cape Cod or Long Island situation know this is not a no-brainer. Okay? There are definite people. This is the output of a Pennsylvania wind farm over two years. Not steady. Okay? Not steady. Uh, and by the way, it's highest in the winter. This is ours since July 1st. It's lowest in the summer where the loads are what? Highest. It's highest in the winter where the loads are what? Okay. So the big problem is intermittency. And you're going to need to do things like pumped hydro storage. This is one of the biggest ones in the continental US, the Raccoon Mountain. Uh, or compressed air energy storage, which is what New York is using. Uh, they're thinking about using. They're putting in 3,000 megawatts of wind in upstate New York. They're going to have to put in 2,000 megawatts of some kind of storage. Well, compressed air energy storage uses natural gas, as it turns out. That's the ugly secret of it. Where you can, uh, things like pumped hydro storage are a really good idea. Flywheels, batteries, ultra capacitors, keep an eye on. But intermittency is worse for solar, by the way, than it is for wind. I have two years of data from solar in Arizona. Naively, you think there's not a cloud in the sky in Arizona. It's bad. Okay. I'll tell you more of that later. Okay, so coal. Let's talk about that. Half of the electricity, all these uh, plants are getting long in the tooth. Okay, we haven't built much new coal, uh, and they'll soon need to be replaced. Well, we can, as it turns out, replace them with a type of coal uh, that does permit the CO2 80, 90 percent to be captured. It's called coal gasification. The issues are cost, and without a CO2 price in this country, nobody's going to build one. Okay, well, a few demonstration ones, but all the pieces are there. This is not pie in the sky. Okay? A half of that generation can be replaced with carbon capture uh, coal. These are a couple of examples uh, that I've visited. This is the Wabash plant in uh, Indiana. And this is a new station uh, in Tampa in Florida. Okay? These are small, about uh, 250 megawatts each. Okay? But all the pieces are there. What do you do with the CO2? Well, this is a coal gasification plant that's not for electricity up in uh, North Dakota. And they ship the CO2 hundreds of miles up here to the Weyburn field in Saskatchewan and use it for enhanced oil recovery. CO2 is quite valuable. They'll pay about $10 a ton of CO2 uh, for enhanced oil recovery. Not carbon neutral. You get out more carbon than you put in, in this case. But still, you know, it shows all the pieces are there. And these are storing it not to get uh, other fossil fuels out of the ground, but real storage in deep saltwater lakes underground. Actually, they're not lakes. They're uh, saltwater permeated formations. You can store the CO2. It's being done on the Sleipner field off Norway here, and BP's Insala plant in Algeria are doing it. We know we can do it. The pieces are all there. Okay. So how about solar? I talked a little bit about it. Solar thermal 
is quite reasonable. Now, to put a uh, kind of number on this, there's 4,000 times more solar energy that falls on the US than we need for our electric power. Okay? If you can use it economically, good idea. Okay? Solar thermal may work. Solar photovoltaic is a joke okay? uh, because of cost and intermittency. Um, we have, as I say, two years of data. The capacity factor is 19%. That is, if you say, if I operated this thing at its rated capacity for all the year, I would get 100%. A, a nuclear plant is about, uh, depending on the year, between 89 and 91%. A coal plant, a new one will be about 80%. This is 19%. Okay? So if it costs the same as a nuclear facility, actually it costs quite a bit more than a nuclear facility, and you're using it one quarter as much, you do the math. Not a good idea. Okay, and it's very intermittent. These are three big arrays in Arizona that track the sun, the best kind of arrays, really costly. And you can see that clouds affect all of them. Okay. So, your state government and mine has decided that we need 800 megawatts of solar in this state. I've calculated that that's gonna cost you $1.8 billion over the cost of wind between now and 2020. Okay, so you know these fixed ideas that people have: solar is great, <laughs> let's get solar. These are costly. Okay, and that's only 800 megawatts. Okay, solar PV is not a good idea. Photovoltaic, solar thermal is not a joke. It, it may actually work. Now, some other ways: get carbon out of the air directly. You can scrub it. We had a graduate student who. Uh, is doing that, and it turns out you can do it for about $140 a ton of CO2. Okay? Um, you can build one of these carbon capture and sequestration coal plants for about a third or a fourth of that. But it might be good for some of the other mechanisms that people are using, like cars. Right? Um, so, can we afford it? Well, let's talk about some numbers. These are various ways and these are the costs per ton of CO2, which is one metric. Conservation programs that have been demonstrated up to eh, maybe 4% of load, there is a cap on them, can be cost effective about $10 a ton of CO2. Coal gasification of the order of $40 a ton of, of CO2. Nuclear, well, whose numbers do you want? Okay, um, The nuclear industry, to have you believe it, can come down to this. Uh, numbers that I've gotten from a Tepper school graduate who just tried to buy one are like this. Okay, we'll see what NRGs are when you guys get a number. But you know, call it $50 a ton of CO2. I did some work looking at wind power in Texas, including all of the transmission you had to put in. Again, it's about $50 a ton of CO2. Um, other kinds of plants are this way. Geothermal. How many of you read the Wall Street Journal today? Come on! Tepper school graduates aren't reading the journal. Oh, oh. <laughs> okay, there's a long article about geothermal. So geothermal is maybe $75 a ton of CO2. You can do it in natural gas and so forth. Solar, look at this number. Let me do it graphically. Um, right, so this is two axes. One is what we were talking about, the cost per ton. So this is basically the running cost, and this is the capital cost, okay? So wind isn't bad. Wind is actually quite competitive. Uh, coal gasification has higher capital costs, lower running costs. Natural gas has lower capital costs, but double the running costs. Look at solar. Okay, look at geothermal. Nuclear, too early to tell. So, can we afford it at all? We spent between 1.5% and 2% of GDP on the Clean Air Act. More on the Clean Water Act uh, to add in, but I don't have those numbers. There's a good study done on this. Uh, in the 70s and 80s. Our best estimates are that it's going to be of the order of a half a percent to clean up the electric power industry. Okay. Um, it's not going to bankrupt us, no matter what the National Association of Manufacturers says. Electric prices are going up for a bunch of reasons, but this is not going to kill us. It will increase your electric power price. We're spending in this country about uh, round number 300 billion on electric power. Uh, there's lots of reasons why it's gone up from about 220 billion. Um, 
it's probably going to go to 400 or 450 billion with carbon control. 150 billion, yeah, we can afford that. And that's 38% of the CO2. The globally averaged estimates, you know, are a wide range, but the bulk of the models are, again, of the order of a half a percent to 1% of GDP, world GDP. It's probably affordable. Okay. So, the bottom line increasing levels of greenhouse gases and the climate changes are a real, they really are real, and they are a major problem. There are going to be winners and losers. Pittsburgh's probably going to be a winner. You know, the rivers don't dry up. I don't mind better Februarys. But there's going to be a lot of losers. And let's remember, losers torque the system. They're the ones who complain, either the congressmen or with guns. Right? Um, there's going to be pressure for enormous changes in both the type and the operation of global energy systems. Okay? And to stabilize concentrations, we're going to have to reduce greenhouse gas emissions by 80 or 90 percent. Okay? It's probably affordable at about the cost of the Clean Air Act. So thank you all very much. And I think I've left uh, some time for questions. Okay, thank you. And so I know this isn't a real shy bunch. Right. Is hydro completely out of the picture? Hydro is not completely out of the picture. You know, we have about 30% of our electricity in this country is low carbon. 8% uh, of that is hydro. 20% uh, is nuclear. Okay, and there's a smattering of other stuff, mostly uh, biomass, uh, wood, and wood waste in, in uh, pulp plants. Hydro, when I was born, 1949, was 30% all by itself. It's gotten diluted by demand. We're not building any new high dams anymore. In fact, even the Canadians aren't. For two reasons. One is that in our country, we've used most of the good sites. Uh, in Canada, it's the other reason, which is that people are recognizing that dams do cause some significant ecological dislocations. You know, the Glen Canyon Dam is the most famous example in this country. In this country, even if it didn't, we probably have about run out of our high head hydro. Canada could supply us some hydro, but they've stopped building hydro. In the rest of the world, of course, you know the Three Gorges Dam is the biggest hydro project in the world. And there's lots of hydro in Africa that's available, although they're talking nuclear. Uh, I get an article, I think, today from the journal. I can't believe Tepper's graduates aren't reading the journal. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Yeah, right. Um, remind us what the IPCC is. I'm sorry, I should have done that. The Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, uh, which is a UN mandated panel that was set up under the UN framework on uh, uh, climate, UN framework climate convention, uh, to bring together really pretty close to 800 uh, uh, scientists from around the world. Uh, in various working panels to assess uh, the scientific literature on uh, climate change. Thank you so much. Yes? First of all, I have to say in my defense, I, I am a Temple School graduate, but I did not read the Wall Street Journal <laughs> because I was looking at someone's geothermal heat system. Very good. So I have, uh, that's my excuse. Mm. <laughs> yeah. I think, I think ground source uh, heat pumps capital cost uh, is still an issue. The operating costs are pretty good. They've gotten the O&M down. Right. But the capital cost is still fairly high. I had to drill a well 200 feet deep. <gasps> Ouch. Yeah. He's this that's guy here saying that's not bad. That doesn't seem like a lot. <laughs> no. So, but anyway, I have, an, I have another question. For you. Yeah. And I'm not an economist, so I don't, don't understand how this works. But somehow it seems to me that if we switch over to alternative sources of energy, let's say wind in Denmark, okay. for example. Yeah. I think Denmark uses a lot of wind energy. 20% wind. Okay. Yeah. So doesn't the effect of getting a lot of energy from wind in Denmark, let's say, have a spillover effect of somehow dropping peak demand for fossil fuels and therefore dropping the price of fossil fuels in a way that a question. you could yeah. think of this like investment in uh, alternative energy as being not only an investment where the alternative energy sources pay for their own capital cost, but there's some kind of spillover effect where it drops the cost of traditional energy sources because it consumes mm -hmm. some of the peak demand. 
as if you certainly have. It's, it actually it turns out wind blows at night, so what it does is reduce base load demand, not peak demand. Okay. Okay. But other than that, you've got it right. And there's a famous, incorrect, but famous paper uh, that uses that analogy uh, of wind and solar being like treasury bills in a portfolio. That you remember the efficient frontier and all of that. A couple of guys got a Nobel Prize for it and, and made that argument. It turns out to be incorrect because largely of the intermittency issue. In Denmark, uh, they buffer their wind with German, uh, mostly German uh, gas and coal, a little bit of Norse hydro. Last year, when one of the two main power lines was going down for maintenance to Germany, they did a study to find out, you know, they didn't want to be in a world of hurt if the other one had a fault. They had to run all five of their domestic oil plants, run them at idle in case the wind drops, which of course it does abruptly. And so they were actually using quite a bit more fossil fuels. When you ramp a fossil fuel plant up and down, it's not operating efficiently at all. And not only are you using more fuel than you would if you operated at steady state, but your NOx emissions are higher. And I've got a student who's just quantifying that, and it's actually quite interesting. You do get some benefit, but it's not what you think you would get. Um, yes, it does depress the uh, amount of fuels. And in Hawaii, for example, on the Big Island, where you've got just oil generators and wind, at 33 megawatts of wind, 200 megawatts of load, it does help. Although it's driving the operators crazy, <laughs> but it does help. So yeah, I mean, largely that's right. Yes, one here and then here. I understand that methane and water moisture are major uh, greenhouse to have contributors to bring the greenhouse effect. Yep. You didn't talk about those. Nope. Are they steady state? Is that yep. the reason? Uh, methane isn't quite st steady state, uh, but it's actually dwarfed by some of the other gases. Water is essentially steady state. Uh, methane is a very powerful greenhouse gas, and you don't want to be releasing a lot of it, but it, as it turns out, the methane emissions are uh, not dramatically different. You know, it's NOx uh, and um, uh, CO2, a few of the other fluorocarbons. I think I did show uh, a methane, a piece of a methane slide. But if you graph all the other greenhouse gases in the US, I remember this graph in the US, they're steady since 1990, which is when this graph started. And it's CO2 that's been linearly increasing. So. Um, they're, they're there. At some level, they should be controlled, but it's CO2 that's really the increase. Yes? Yes, I'm, I'm an architect and uh, graduated from CMU School of Architecture. The, uh, you presented alternative fuel sources, yeah. um, but you didn't get too much into alternative consumption. Sure, and, uh, sure. Obviously, um, in the architecture profession, we're working towards green yeah. building. And you so bet. And, and that's uh, very important. Yeah. And I did talk a bit about conservation. You did. Yeah. Now, I, is, there, is there any impact or any study that you know of that you pointed to that, that kind of gets into what is the impact of, of uh, changes to the way we consume energy, whether it's uh, building energy, mm -hmm. uh, personal consumption of energy, sure. and, and sure. your product uh, development and product you manufacturing? Let me tell you the best studies are in California. California over the last 25 years has kept the per capita use of electricity. I don't know their whole energy numbers. I'm an electricity specialist. Level, absolutely flat. They have 5% increase over 25 years. The rest of the country has gone up by 50% per capita. Problem is the number of capitas has gone up, right? California is in migration. You know, so they're actually using about 30% more electricity than they were. But the Carnegie Mellon Green Design Initiative, uh, two co-directors, my colleague Lester Lave, who's in the office next door to me, the Tepper School, and Chris Hendrickson, who's the head of, um, or immediate past head of uh, civil environmental engineering, will be able to answer the question about buildings. 
uh, and just uh, email Lester, lave at cmu.edu, and, um, and ask him that question about buildings. There's no question that Efficiency Vermont, which has given very good subsidies for uh, good building and so forth, has had excellent results. And I think California has too. Okay. Okay. You know, what's not smart are these subsidies for building mounted um, solar photovoltaic things, you know, $10,000 a kilowatt, whatever. But, you know, all the standards, that's great. I think that's really good. You know, we shouldn't ever build anything with two by fours. Ought to be two by sixes. Right? We shouldn't ever build another building with two by fours. Jay, don't you think, I mean, all your models are based on current state technologies. Don't you think it's just a matter of time within five or ten years, technology will, will make, let's say, solar more cost effective. It'll, it may improve some of these other alternative energies. Let me talk to solar. Um, if you look at what's called the learning curve okay, for solar, it's been getting worse. Uh, solar is about 30% more expensive now than it was two or three years ago. Why? Because they've run out of waste silicon, and they're now having to compete with the chip manufacturers. Despite all of the hype that you read, there has been no advance in solar technology caused by the enormous, as the Europeans call them, feed-in tariffs. They're paying 60 cents a kilowatt subsidy for solar in Germany. In Germany, mm -hmm. there's one place worse than Pittsburgh for solar, it's Germany. <laughs> um, and I mean, it's just dumb. We don't need to be putting subsidies into deployment for solar. We need to be putting R&D money into breakthrough. You're going to need a significant breakthrough to make solar anywhere near as cost effective. Even if you take the learning curves before they ran out of waste silicon, and extrapolate them. It's three times the total planetary electricity production before it gets down to the current price of nuclear. <laughs> you know, okay, right. So, what's your recommendation then? So, give up on solar subsidies. Okay. Put your money into solar uh, research if you're if you're a solar guy. My view is that uh, the portfolio of what's going to happen or these, at least seven areas. Let me see if I can name demand reduction, clearly. Okay. Uh, nuclear, I think, has, has a role. Wind, you know, wind could play 20%. Um, I think that advanced coal with carbon capture and sequestration, post combustion capture on other fossil fuels like natural gas, you can put an amine scrubber uh, on the end of that, and probably a couple of others that I'm going to kick myself for, for not remembering uh, right away. Uh, but yes, no silver bullet. Okay? Now it's not all going to be even. You know, there's, there's um, instead of wedges of various technologies, there's usually bumps where one technology really becomes a winner for a while. But uh, I think it's going to be a portfolio of, of these kind of things. And I do not think that solar PV is part of that portfolio. I think that solar thermal is probably a small part of that portfolio. Um, I'm a CIT graduate. So All right. Um, you mentioned the intermittency of yeah. both solar and wind, but it sounded like they were almost 180 degrees out of phase. Uh, wind works at night, solar works in the day. Yeah. Wind works in the winter, solar during the summer. Is there a combination of the two that works? That's a. Uh, first thing that I did when I got all this one second data is I played it together. The first thing that people think is if you get a lot of uh, wind from different locations, you play it together, it'll all smooth out. The correlation is enormous. I've got some data from wind farms in Allentown and down to West Virginia, and the correlation is really high. Okay? And then we took our solar data from Arizona and played it with some wind data from New Mexico. Arizona doesn't have any wind. And besides which, nobody wants to build transmission lines. I mean, there's a little smoother. One thing about wind too is feasible only in certain areas of the country, and they're not necessarily places where they're in the population center. Right. So you have transmission issues that you put a bunch of wind farms in one place, and that transmission gets a lot of what needs to be to do that. Now, there is some thought that offshore wind off the East Coast may be as good as some of the Great Plains winds, but it's still going to require tremendous capital cost and tremendous transmission lines. 
you know, and, and look at the opposition to wind off Long Island and off Cape Cod, right? I, we're in Pennsylvania, you know. I, I just got a call Saturday two weeks ago from the head of the Chamber of Commerce in Tyrone, you know, and he wanted to know where he could get some information because people were coming to him, his Chamber of Commerce members, saying we don't want this stuff spotting the tourism in Tyrone, Pennsylvania. So I, I pointed him to a National Academy study. I, you know, I don't have an opinion on it. But, so. Is there one over here? Yes. Yeah. Um, I'll beat the solar force, force again a little bit more. I don't want to but beat up too much on solar, except the, well, our well, sainted well, state has put this in. So. BP tried that 10 years ago. Um, they, you know, they said, look, we're, we really believe that by bringing energy to the billion people who are not grid connected at the moment, that they will become better customers, right? They put in about, uh, let's see, three quarters of a billion dollars of solar in Africa, and none of it is working today. For what reason? Uh, it was, the metal was stolen. It's got to be indigenous. It's got to be indigenous. Yeah. I have a question about the nuclear issue. Now I realize that it takes a tremendous amount of energy to just repair excavated uranium for power generation. I was wondering how, how, how that kind of offsets. Sure. Yeah, if you look at efficient uh, operations of that, uh, it's about, let's see, last time I looked, it was something like an 85 to 1 energy ratio. You know, as opposed to 1 to 1 for corn ethanol. I didn't talk about biomass, but corn ethanol is essentially a farm subsidy program. Uh, cellulosic ethanol makes sense, but not corn ethanol. Uh, but nuclear, there's so much more energy than you get out, than you put into the uranium. Uh, you, know, you know the chemistry of that, but I, it's not that hard to separate, as it turns out. Well, since you brought it up, the uh, cellulose uh, corn ethanol, is there any hope in this country? <laughs> Cellulosic? Well, yeah. okay, I'll turn it over to my chemist friends, but basically we need a good, efficient enzyme. But it looks pretty decent. You know, so, like I said, corn ethanol is a joke. Right. right. But uh, the Brazilians have sugar cane ethanol, which is a lot easier to break down. The, the enzymes for cellulosic ethanol, maybe you know what the current status is. I would, I would say promising is, is still, promising. Yeah. yeah. Not there yet, but promising. Uh, and so I'd put some R&D dollars in that. If I was the Secretary of Energy, I'd place some bets on, on that slot in the roulette wheel. I really would. Yeah. So they put it into Tennessee. Yeah. Oak Ridge National Lab and University of Tennessee That's right. has a big yeah. grant. That's that right. Project. And I don't know what their biology and chemistry is like, but, you know, they're good people. So, I was just in Knoxville yesterday. <laughs> yeah. How is your thinking G without Gore? Um, so, I was on the same program with Gore down at a, a meeting in Costa Rica. Uh, he wasn't able to come. He did it by video. He had a medical issue. Um, and, you know, so I, that was the first time that I'd heard him talk in real time. And he was pretty sensible. He really was. I mean... The only issue that I have, aside from you know, niggling things with uh, an inconvenient truth, was that he left you kind of like you feel at the end of a Jacques Cousteau film where they're clubbing the baby seals, you know. Ooh, this is terrible. Um, <laughs> you know, he didn't leave you with, with how you could make money at this, you know, and what the hope was. And there are, as I said, there's, there's definitely a portfolio of things that's going to work. That, that was the only complaint I had with that. One or two more. How we do? Oh, we're doing okay on time. Yeah. I have a question on the thermal model that you use to model the average of temperature. I guess my first question is, how do you uh, determine the average temperature of the Earth? And so Good question. How do you guarantee the accuracy of 1.5 degrees or, or one degree? Because you know, from a Mu much less than that, actually. Yeah. Standpoint, uh -huh. It can be two to five degrees in this room, let alone right. the entire Earth. Jim Hansen at uh, the Goddard Institute for Space Science in New York uh, is probably the world's expert on that and, and just 
Google some of Jim's papers. The basic methodology uh, is, is two. One is temperature gauges that are kind of a worldwide standard of calibration that's been pretty much unchanged for about 120 years. The problem with the on-land calibration of those isn't the instrumentation, which is pretty good. It's the fact that cities have encroached on the sites and cities retain the energy during the day and, and emit it at night. There are corrections for those, and you know, having looked pretty skeptically at some of those early papers back from the late 70s, I think they're getting pretty good at making those corrections. But the better data set is actually tidal gauge data sets, which also have temperature sensors with them. And those are generally much more isothermal than the city areas. And that data set is really pretty good. Um, there's some checks that you can make on those. One of those is a really interesting data record. And that's the dates at which lakes have frozen over and thawed. It turns out those records are tremendously uh, ancient. They go back, well, I shouldn't say ancient. They go back to the 1700s because they were very much important to commerce. And so these were first dug out of New England, and then people dug them out of Europe and Russia and all over the world. And, and those ice in and ice out dates can be used to provide a pretty good check on the global mean temperature. And they check very well. So, you know, like anything, it's a preponderance of evidence kind of thing. And they get the error bars down all right. I, you know, I was pretty skeptical because I used to do planetary atmospheres where, you know, it was lucky if you got out within 10 degrees. Um, and I'm pretty well convinced. I think they do a pretty nice job. Let's see. And I think there was one more. And yeah, we should probably let you guys. What do you think is going to happen with transportation? What do I think is going to happen with transportation? I think the first thing that's going to happen is CAFE standards, corporate average fuel economy standards, which haven't changed since 1979, are going to go to $35 a gallon over Dingle's dead body. I mean, 35 gal miles per gallon. Uh, congressman Dingle is the congressman from General Motors. Uh, and, <laughs> and he is going to fight it to his last breath. But I think it's going to happen. And, and, you know, my friends in Detroit tell me that 35 miles a gallon is quite feasible and that 50 is possible. I think plug-in hybrids are going to happen. Toyota's pushed back the date of their million uh, vehicle introduction uh, by a couple of years, maybe 2009. But, you know, a million vehicles is, is three-tenths of one percent of the cars on the road in the U.S. There's one car per person in the U.S. if you have it. Anyway. So, um, I think if we have a significant carbon price of the order of $20 a ton of CO2 to $35 a ton of CO2, you'll see very large shifts to the more efficient way of powering vehicles, which is, guess what? You guys make the product. It's, it's electricity. And, but I think that it's not a foregone conclusion. Because CAFE standards will take us a long way to that. And, th and there's no question that CAFE can go up to 35 you know, within a year. It could easily do that, I think. So. Anyway, thank you all very much. I really appreciate your time. <laughs> Over to you.